legally recognized as belonging to indigenous peoples and local communities um, at the global level. In Africa, um, indigenous peoples and local communities own customary like, a, a, around 80% of the land, but they have legal recogni recogni recognition only of about 16% of, of, of the land. An estimated globally 300, um, 370 million hectares of, of own for communities, indigenous and people, um, uh, indigenous people and, and local communities land coincide with um, the area where you have the most high biodiversity um, at the global level. Also, um, I wanted to mention that there are studies that were done to see the coincidence or the overlap between protected areas and, and lands that are owned by indigenous peoples and local communities, and that gives an amount of um, almost 50% of the lands of the protected areas globally that overlaps with the lands um, customarily owned by indigenous, uh, but also um, local community. But if you see everywhere at the global level, indigenous people are the most poor or and vulnerable of all the communities. They make almost only 5% of the population of the world, but, um, but they are the most uh, vulnerable and the most um, um, poor communities in the world. And up to 2.5 uh, billion of people around the world globally actually, are depending for their um, subsistence on lands that belong uh, and the customary right to communities and um, indigenous and local and communities. Also, if you go to the third world, um, you, you have around 80% of all the food produced and consumed, um, used in, in the third world that are locally produced, meaning produced um, in the lands that are owned and, and managed um, customary by indigenous peoples and, and local communities. And in that uh, are on the land belong, belonging to um, indigenous peoples and, uh, and, and local communities. And this leads us to say that investing in, um, in the land rights of indigenous peoples and local communities is the most effective and the most cost um, effective strategy for preserving land, but, o but also for sustainably managing ecosystem. So today, we just want to make a call that um, there is a need, um, there is really a need to change approaches. There is, a, there is a need for new approach on how we manage land, on how we manage um, um, uh, landscape, even on how we invest in landscape restoration globally. By what? By, first of all, putting the United Nations Declaration on the Indigenous People like in the central, in the center of all their, their approaches and, and initiative by making sure that we can strengthen and promote right-based approaches to sustainable, um, to forest management and land management, but also to um, create and put in place and make sure that the mechanism of accountability um, are, pretty, uh, are pretty effective and working on the ground. So this, uh, by, by saying this, I'm going to end my, my presentation um, right there. So accountability and reparation mechanism are really really strong, uh, strongly important on all the initiative or approaches we can develop on, um, on landscape restoration to make sure that all these initiatives can have impact because based on communities, right, using um, local knowledge and respecting rights and contributing to sustainable um, development locally. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much, Patrick, for this overview and introduction. And like I said at the beginning in my introduction, we needed to have this sage uh, set, uh, set so we understand what do we mean by uh, this link between securing the rights of local communities, indigenous peoples, rural women, and restoration. And I think Patrick really helped us uh, get that through. Then uh, I'll call on my colleague uh, from Kenya, from the Forest Indigenous Peoples uh, Network, uh, Peter Kitelo, and uh, Milka, so we can talk about the specific case of Kenya. While they're joining us, what we, could really, what we should really know about Kenya is that the 2010 constitution in Kenya launched a major reform 
of the country's land and forest sector, recognizing the collective uh, nature of land ownership, as well as community right to customary and ancestral land. And in 20, 2016, there were two major like, laws that were adopted. We have the, the government passed the Community Land Act, but also the Forest Conservation and Management Act was uh, passed. So these two um, new law really like, are opportunities to really secure uh, indigenous peoples and local community uh, right to land and to forest. But at the same time, there are challenges really associated with that at the local level. And uh, today, um, Milka, who is an anthropologist and member of the Sangware indigenous uh, peoples from the Kabolet forest, will tell us about the available opportunities for indigenous women in ecological and landscape restoration. But before Milka, Peter Kitelo, uh, who is from the Kenya Forest Indigenous Peoples Network, will tell us about the journey to community land justice for the forest indigenous communities of Kenya. And uh, we want to welcome uh, both of you. I'll start with uh, Peter. Peter, it would be great to know about your community what people do, but also what is the relationship of your community to their ancestral land and uh, ancestral forest? Okay, uh, good morning. Good morning. Okay, uh, my name's uh, Peter Kitelo. Uh, I come from the Agie community in Mount Kenya, uh, sorry, <laughs> Mount Elgon. That's at the border of Kenya, and Uganda, and uh, on the map, you can see the, the far, told I can use this, that's Uganda, this is Kenya. Okay, and uh, I will make a very short presentation, being uh, a member of the Ogier community, but also being uh, associated with uh, an organization, uh, grassroots organization called Chepkitale Indigenous Peoples Development Program, and uh, the, f uh, the Forest Indigenous Peoples Network is a loose network of communities of similar interests uh, in Kenya. So uh, the journey, uh, when I grew up, uh, when I was young, uh, around this area, uh, I knew this was the only land that uh, belonged to our community, that one. But as time went by, uh, and as I grew up, uh, because there was a lot of evictions around that area, I experienced five when I was young, uh, I came to know, and this I came to know the last five years, actually, that actually this was the boundaries of our ancestral land. And uh, myself, together with others, uh, we developed uh, this, you know, with the community, we developed this uh, map that shows our ancestral land. And... Uh, uh, we were told we were evicted from these areas uh, by, during the colonial times and uh, restricted to these areas, which today are categorized into three protected areas. That's the Mount Elgon Forest. Mount Elgon Forest is this one. Uh, you see that map comes up to here like that. That's Mount Elgon Forest. And then this is part of the Mount Elgon Forest. And then this is Mount Elgon National Park. So in this one, it was uh, before 1932, which when the community, during the colonial time at the White Island. And then the other evictions happened between 1932, I think, and uh, about 1940s, violent evictions. The community was being pushed up the mountain. This is Mount Elgon. And uh, 1968 is when the community was moved again from these areas. This is Mount Elgon Ni N National Park. I, that, that one is very recent. And then in 2000, uh, this area was converted from a community land to, uh, to, a, to a game reserve. But still, you know, the community members are there. And you can see this one was created as, uh, it's called, in Kenya, it's called a settlement scheme, that the community was supposed to be moved from these areas and be pushed into this area. So uh, that's the history of my community. And uh, uh, when I was growing up, uh, or oh, as I, be, uh, I started getting sense, I was questioning why uh, were we being uh, moved. 
because these have been our lands. And uh, the answer I was getting uh, was that from the government officials was that that's what the law says. So it has been my concern and others uh, to, you know, during the constitutional making to have our, some of the provisions in the law to be captured. So today we have some provisions in the law that looks into that. And that has been the history of all the forest communities in Kenya. Great, thank you for uh, that great uh, introduction and presentation about your community. It would be good to know also about the challenges that you're facing and how you're addressing those challenges, but also to tell us have there been any intervention by the communities in addressing forest loss, biodiversity? Are they really involved in forest restoration? So if you can really, in like five minutes, okay. just summarize. And ODAS worked uh, for um, the International uh, Land uh, Coalition and as the Africa Program Manager. But also we have Shadrach, the end, Shadrach Omondi, who is the chairman of ILC Africa. And Shadrach and uh, Odas will tell us about the role of multi-stakeholder platforms in enhancing land governance and restoration in Africa. And they will be focusing on the case of Madagascar. So this next panel, the focus is really on uh, Madagascar. I will just start maybe with uh, ILC, with Shadrach. If you can tell us a little bit about the ILC uh, national engagement strategy and what it means and how it relates to the issues that we are talking about today, like land, uh, land uh, and forest uh, restoration. Uh, thank you uh, very much. As uh, you've been told, I'm Shadrach Omondi. I work with Reconcile, but I also chair ILC Africa. And ILC is a coalition of organizations, intergovernmental organizations, civil societies. Right now we are over 200, and in Africa we have a membership of over 70. And we, we are also in over 24 countries. The main interest and concern of ILC is to improve people-centered land governance. How do we make people to be at the center of how we govern, use, and manage our land so that people can get the best out of it. And based on this kind of a concern, ILC has been able to come up with what we call the multi-stakeholders platforms, which are established at the national level, but also at the regional level. And I think that's the major focus of our discussion today, the role of this kind of uh, multi-stakeholder platforms in improving land governance, but also land restoration. And if you look at uh, the ongoings within the region, you realize that there's a lot of land reforms that are currently going on. Even the case that we've just had, the Kenyan case with the indigenous people, there are a lot of land reforms involved there. And from the presentation they've just given, and also if you look at the region, there is a challenge in terms of consultations. How do you have a broad-based inclusive framework that would draw in different perspectives from different stakeholders and that will eventually help define a joint action understood with everyone? Grappling with that matter, ILC started the process of building platforms or forums that bring different stakeholders together from government, from civil societies, from research institutions, from the universities, from the private sector, so that there is a space of interaction. There's a space where common understanding can be developed. There's a space where consensus can be developed, and then these joint actions are driven. This has been very helpful at the national, within the national ILC as what we call the national engagement strategies that bring the stakeholders within that particular country. At the regional, ILC has what we call the commitments. We have 10 best commitments. From these commitments, we bring in different stakeholders at the regional level that come and discuss and agree 
on common actions and how they move forward. This has been very, very critical in terms of connecting like-minded stakeholders to pursue collaborations or look for solutions together. It is also important in terms of mobilizing the stakeholders for the joint actions. And three, it is also very important for helping influence processes jointly. Thus, the multi-stakeholder platforms help in building common voices that eventually moves the agenda forward. And I think that is also relevant for land restoration. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this is really important how to like, you know, help influence the processes, but also how to really come together. And we know that it's not easy to get different like, stakeholders together, like private sector, government, civil society organizations, indigenous peoples network, just to talk together. And I think that's something very needed. And uh, Shadrach, you did a good job explaining at ILC, at the regional level, really what is being done and also this uh, national engagement strategy. I would like to turn it to Odas to give us an example. For example, Madagascar, ILC is very well established there, and you have been really part of this type of multi-stakeholder engagement. What can we learn from that experience in Madagascar? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as uh, Shadrach has put it, uh, also our friend Peter, who was uh, presenting here, the the main problem is uh, uh, the starting point, the role, the policies. Peter, when he was asking why they are being evicted, the answer was because it is that the role says. So that's uh, the starting for point for, for our, um, our multi-stakeholder platforms. We, we focus at influencing roles and policy formulations, and we have seen uh, this working in Madagascar, uh, where we started supporting this approach uh, uh, for the last six years, since 2012. And uh, the multi platform in Madagascar is hosted by CIF. CIF is a big coalition of civil society organizations. And this uh, uh, CIF, together with other IRC members and non-members who are interested in, in land governance in Madagascar, have been working so hard uh, to um, influence the land reform process in, in Madagascar. They, through advocacy, through uh, 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 raising awareness, um, through <coughs> uh, developing policy reviews, sharing them uh, with uh, the relevant actors, engaging uh, the government, engaging uh, the office of Kamara Erot, and. Uh, in 2015, uh, our members were very happy to see uh, a, a land call that was really, as we put it, what, what that was uh, uh, people-centered. And in ILC, uh, these multi-stakeholder platforms, they, they work around the ILC commitment that uh, Shadrach talked about. And all the 10 ILC commitments, or can also put it as uh, 10 thematic areas, they are really they are really uh, all around achieving roles and policies that are people-centered, from land tenure, security, to farming, farming, to ensuring uh, right, territorial rights to, for indigenous peoples. So all the ten, they are around uh, ensuring people-centered land governance. And from that angle, we, we, we believe that if there are good roles and policies, that will ensure that there is increased increased uh, land ownership, there is increased security uh, for land owners, and this will promote responsible land use. And when you have responsible land use, you are sure that there won't be a, a land de degradation, there will be rather land protection. So in Madagascar, uh, through uh, this platform that is supported uh, by ILC and of course other, other, other partners, we have seen how a multi-stakeholder platform can influence uh, a land reform process in a way that at the end of, of the journey, the, 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 the roles and policies that are put in place are people-centered and promotes uh, land, proper land use and restoration. Um, okay. 
it's not only about influencing land policies, it's also a, a, about making sure that those land policies that are put in place are properly implemented. After, uh, after 2015, now our members in Madagascar are working hand in hand with, uh, with, with other, 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 other stakeholders, especially the government, to make sure that these land laws and policies that are in place are properly implemented in a way that really benefits the, 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 the communities. Thank you. Thank you, Odas. And we also know that in Madagascar, they have uh, their land policy that cover like 2015 to 2030. And many experts have been saying that this is a progressive law when it comes to recognizing uh, community rights. So I'll ask uh, Kamara and I'll ask him in French what he think about this law and what do we need to know about local community rights around this law. Euh, monsieur Camara, donc euh, merci de nous joindre à ce panel. Et comme l'a dit Audace, euh, la réforme foncière à Madagascar est à un autre niveau. Et beaucoup d'experts disent que cette réforme à Madagascar est unique en Afrique et elle est progressive. Donc on aimerait savoir sur le plan de la reconnaissance des droits des communautés locales par rapport à leurs terres, à leurs forêts, qu'est-ce qu'on peut retenir par rapport à cette loi Merci bien, euh, Solange, d'avoir euh, pu nous donner l'opportunité de discuter un petit peu, de partager sur euh, l'expérience malgache, euh, sur la réforme foncière. Au risque de répéter ce qu'avait dit notre ami Audace en anglais, je vais essayer d'expliquer un petit peu pourquoi au niveau de Madagascar, on a engagé cette réforme euh, foncière. Enfin, il ne faut pas oublier qu'en 2005, c'est en 2005 que nous avons mis en œuvre effectivement cette réforme foncière. Et ce processus a été initié justement par la société civile dont vient de mentionner notre ami Audace, qui est la solidarité des intérêts. Conservation bylaws, and in that, the community has committed to how they are going to use their lands, which is how they've been using the traditional way of using. Uh, I'm told there is one minute. Uh, and then, so, and, and those bylaws is actually uh, uh, land rights on conservation conditions. That's what the community is, is as, uh, committed to. And then you can see the mapping. Mapping, this is all the work of the community, and you can see the, air, the red places where you see red. Those are very, very, actually, the, there is a, a system in Kenya that is allowed called Pelis that, you know, it's allowed for communities around the forest to do cultivation in the forest. Those are the areas that the community has been able to map and, and, and can be seen on the map. And then uh, the community has also been working with conservation uh, organizations like KWS who have re recognized that the community has been useful in working on uh, the elephant, uh, you know. Uh, elephant protection, just an example. So uh, I think those are just few examples. There's plenty of others. Uh, and uh, because of time, I think I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. I mean, what I could really get out of your presentation is like communities should be at the center of conservation. But as you're saying, they're still facing some uh, challenges. But also, communities uh, are using their traditional bylaws to really do conservation. And you believe that those type of practices should be taken into account when it comes to restoration. But also, communities are really collaborating with conservation agencies to really see how they can work together to restore the forest and to conserve the forest. Now, I would like to turn into Milka. So Milka could really tell us about indigenous women, because generally we talk about indigenous people in general, but we want to know more about indigenous women. And Milka is uh, from, uh, the, she wants to tell us about the sanguary women of uh, Embobut, and also about their opportunities, but also how women in those communities are really managing and conserving the forest. So Milka, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. My name, as you've heard, is Milka Shopkorir. I have been working with uh, my community in Embobut Forest, although I come from Kabulet Forest, for some time now, looking at the effects of eviction to women and children. 
So in Embobot Forest, uh, the Senguer had been living in the forest, which is gazetted as a protected area and was gazetted back by, by the colonial government in 1954, I think. And uh, since then, there have been a series of evictions of the community from that part of the forest, where we have lived as a community for ages. And we know that that is home, and we have not been conserving that place. It is our way of life that has conserved the forest. So when the government comes in and throws people out, they just fail to understand. As Peter says, it's, it's like resisting change, failing to understand that it is not just written things that show people can conserve, but also the way people live conserves. And the women in Emberwood Forest, of course the evictions having been characterized by burning of houses and be people being beat beaten or arrested and others arraigned in court, you can imagine what it is for the women. So they lose a lot of property, some of them are beaten, their children sleep in the cold, themselves sleep in the cold, and as a community we've lost young children in the cold, we've lost many of, of, of the elderly in the cold as well. And uh, so the eviction is, is causing kind of a broken link between the women and the children, so much so that there's no much time and humble environment to pass on the way of life to the next generations. So as a, as a community, the culture and the way of life that has been helping us to conserve this place is getting eroded. And the conflict between the forest, the Kenya Forest Service and the community on the land is now like uh, creating room for other community members around the forest to extract from the forest and make it more degraded and so give the government more reason to evict, cause more suffering to women, cause more suffering to children, cause more suffering to the elderly and the whole community. Uh, of course, there are very, very many other challenges, but the ultimate thing that this eviction is causing is not really conservation as it is meant to be. So all these things, the continuous burning, the breaking, uh, the, the breaking down of the cultural way of life that was conserving and giving room for other communities to come in means the forest is getting degraded. And all over the world, and as we are here today, we are talking about restoring ecosystems, but not really giving a chance to the people who should be restoring these ecosystems themselves. So that is the situation in Embobot Forest, not just for the women, but it's worse for the women, and it's so bad for the whole community. So Milka, you talk about the challenges. Can you tell us about also what are the opportunities? Are there opportunities out there for women to contribute in forest restoration? I would say yes, there are many, there are many uh, opportunities for women. One is, as we all know, we have all been brought up by our mothers. They're the ones who introduce us to nature. They're the ones who introduce us to the society. And in the community as well, they are the ones who are respected by the kids. And so one opportunity is an extension of that domestic care to care for nature, you know? Women can take that opportunity to make sure that the generation, the younger generation, and the youths currently who the, the evictions have like taken away the, 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 their space to learn can restore their knowledge on how to live and conserve the land. Other opportunities are, of course, the laws. Kenya, as at now, in Kenya, there are a lot of national movements on women rights to land. So a recognition in this kind of women rights to land is, a, is, a, is an advantage for the indigenous women who will push for their rights, and it will not just be their rights because their rights to land will mean their community rights to land because there's no way the women will have their own share of land. They will have their land for their 
husbands, for their children, and for everybody else. So, uh, but for me, what I think is a huge opportunity is the opportunity to extending the domestic care to nature because that is the only way you can correct a behavior that was, maybe if, if, if the youth have an urge of destroying nature, the only way to correct that is to make sure that they own the process themselves. They know how important to take care of nature, and so they know how much to take out and how much to leave for continuity. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Milka, for raising the challenges and uh, the opportunities. Any last key message that you would like to say before I move on to the next panel? <laughs> uh, maybe just one key thing that I would say that maybe most of the movements that fight for women's rights to land, one, one, uh, one thing that I think makes, uh, creates more resistance to the achievement of it is looking at women land rights very separate from the general community land rights. Because as they say, when they, they are pushing for education, when we push for education rights, we will be like, educating a woman is educating the society. So it should be in the same way, realizing the land rights of a woman is realizing the land rights of the community. And so in that way, I am sure that all this resistance about women accessing land, using land, making decisions on land will be so much uh, decreased. Thank you so much. Well, I think that message, maybe we can come back to that during the discussion. Realizing the land rights of women come to realizing the land rights of the communities. And I think there are different school of thought when, we, when it comes to that, but as you could hear from Milka, it's out there. All right, thank you, Milka and Peter. I think we will call into our friend from uh, Madagascar, Jean Ousman, and uh, also from ILC to join us here so we can talk about uh, their work and also have a focus on, on Madagascar. Please uh, join us. Okay, so while they're coming, I'll just introduce them. And uh, we have uh, Jean Ousmane Kamara, who is the national coordinator from uh, Madagascar Land Reform Coordination Unit. And uh, Jean Ousmane will speak in French. Unfortunately, for this kind of event, we don't have translation. Maybe there was translation for the plenary, but for the side event, we couldn't get it. So I'll try to summarize after he speaks, but we'll give him the chance to speak. Um, French and Jausman is the one in the middle actually. And our Liberian friends here who are here, they speak French very well, so we don't need translation actually. All right, so and also I have here um, um, Odas, and Odas works uh, for um, the International uh, Land uh, Coalition and as the Africa program manager. But also we have Shadrach, the end, Shadrach Omonji, who is the chairman of ILC Africa. And Shadrach and uh, Odas will tell us about the role of multi-stakeholder platforms in enhancing land governance and restoration in Africa. And they will be focusing on the case of Madagascar. So this next panel, the focus is really on uh, Madagascar. I will just start maybe with uh, ILC, with Shadrach. If you can tell us a little bit about the ILC uh, national engagement strategy and what it means and how it relates to the issues that we are talking about today, like land, uh, land uh, and forest uh, restoration. Uh, thank you uh, very much. As uh, you've been told, I'm Shadrach Omondi. I work with Reconcile, but I also chair ILC Africa. And ILC is a coalition of organizations, intergovernmental organizations, civil societies. Right now we are over 200, and in Africa we have a membership of over 70. And we, we are also in over 24 countries. The main interest and concern of ILC is to improve people-centered land governance. How do we make people to be at the center of how we govern, use, 
and manage our land so that people can get the best out of it. And based on this kind of a concern, ILC has been able to come up with what we call the multi-stakeholder platforms, which are established at the national level, but also at the regional level. And I think that's the major focus of our discussion today, the role of this kind of multi-stakeholder platforms in improving land governance, but also land restoration. And if you look at uh, the ongoings within the region, you realize that there's a lot of land reforms that are currently going on. Even the case that we've just had, the Kenyan case with the indigenous people, there are a lot of land reforms involved there. And from the presentation they've just given, and also if you look at the region, there is a challenge in terms of consultations. How do you have a broad-based inclusive framework that would draw in different perspectives from different stakeholders and that will eventually help define a joint action understood with everyone. Grappling with that matter, ILC started the process of building platforms or forums that bring different stakeholders together from government, from civil societies, from research institutions, from the universities, from the private sector, so that there is a space of interaction. There's a space where common understanding can be developed. There's a space where consensus can be developed, and then these joint actions are driven. This has been very helpful at the national, within the national ILC as what we call the national engagement strategies that bring the stakeholders within that particular country. At the regional, ILC has what we call the commitments. We have 10 best commitments. From these commitments, we bring in different stakeholders at the regional level that come and discuss and agree on common actions and how they move forward. This has been very, very critical in terms of connecting like-minded stakeholders to pursue collaborations or look for solutions together. It is also important in terms of mobilizing the stakeholders for the joint actions. And three, it is also very important for helping influence processes jointly. Thus, the multi-stakeholder platforms help in building common voices that eventually moves the agenda forward. And I think that is also relevant for land restoration. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this is really important how to like, you know, help influence the processes, but also how to really come together. And we know that it's not easy to get different like stakeholders together, like private sector, government, civil society, organizations, indigenous peoples network, just to talk together, and I think that's something very needed. And uh, Shadrach, you did a good job explaining at ILC, at the regional level, really what is being done, and also this uh, national engagement strategy. I would like to turn it to Odas to give us an example. For example, Madagascar, ILC is very well established there, and you have been really part of this type of multi-stakeholder engagement. What can we learn from that experience in Madagascar? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as uh, Shadrach has put it, uh, also our friend Peter, who was uh, uh, presenting here, the, the main problem is uh, uh, the starting point, the role, the policies. Peter, when he was asking why they are being evicted, the answer was because it is that the role says. So that's uh, the starting for point for, for our um, our multi-stakeholder platforms, we, we focus at influencing roles and policy formulations. And we have seen uh, this working in Madagascar, uh, where we started supporting this approach uh, uh, for the last six years, since 2012. And uh, the multi-stakeholder platform in Madagascar is hosted by CIF. CIF is a big coalition of civil society organizations. 
And this uh, uh, SIF together with other IRC members and none members who are interested in, in land governance in Madagascar have been working so hard uh, to um, influence the land reform process in, in Madagascar. They, through advocacy, through uh, 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 raising awareness, um, through <coughs> uh, developing policy reviews, sharing them uh, with uh, the relevant act actors, engaging uh, the government, engaging uh, the office of Kamara Erot. And uh, in 2015, uh, our members were very happy to see uh, a, a land code that was really as we put it, what, what, what that was uh, uh, people-centered. And in ILC, uh, these multi stakeholder platforms, they, they work around the ILC commitment that uh, Shadrach talked about. And all the 10 ILC commitments, or can also put it as uh, 10 thematic areas, they are really, they are really uh, all around achieving roles and policies that are people-centered from land tenure, security, to family farming, to ensuring uh, right, territorial rights to, for indigenous peoples. So all the 10, they are around uh, ensuring people centered land governance. And from that angle, we, we, we believe that if there are good laws and policies that will ensure that there is increased, increased uh, land ownership, there is increased security, uh, for landowners, and this will promote responsible land use. And when you have responsible land use, you are sure that there won't be a, a land de degradation, there will be a land protection. So in Madagascar, uh, through uh, this platform that is supported uh, by ILC and of course other, other, other partners, we have seen how a multi platform can influence uh, a land reform process in a way that at the end of, of the journey, the, 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 the roles and policies that are put in place are people-centered and promotes uh, run, proper land use and restoration. Um, okay. Uh, it, it's not only about influencing land policies, it's also a, a, about making sure that those land policies that are put in place are properly implemented. After, uh, after 2015, now our members in Madagascar are working hand in hand with uh, with, with other, other 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 stakeholders, especially the government, to make sure that these land laws and policies that are in place are properly implemented in a way that really benefits the the the, the communities. Thank you. Thank you, Odas. And we also know that in Madagascar, they have uh, their land policy that cover like 2015 to 2030. And many experts have been saying that this is a progressive law when it comes to recognizing uh, community rights. So I'll ask uh, Kamara and I'll ask him in French what he think about this law and what do we need to know about local community rights around this law. Uh, Monsieur Kamara, donc, uh, merci de nous joindre à ce panel. Et comme l'a dit Audace, euh, la réforme foncière à Madagascar est à un autre niveau. Et beaucoup d'experts disent que cette réforme à Madagascar est unique en Afrique et elle est progressive. Donc on aimerait savoir sur le plan de la reconnaissance des droits des communautés locales par rapport à leurs terres, à leurs forêts, qu'est-ce qu'on peut retenir par rapport à cette loi Merci bien, euh, Solange d'avoir pu nous donner l'opportunité de discuter un petit peu, de partager sur l'expérience malgache euh, sur la réforme foncière. Au risque de répéter ce qu'avait dit notre ami Audas en anglais, je vais essayer d'expliquer un petit peu pourquoi au niveau de Madagascar, on a engagé cette réforme euh, foncière. Enfin, il ne faut pas oublier qu'en 2005, c'est en 2005 que nous avons mis en œuvre effectivement cette euh, réforme foncière et ce processus a été initié justement par la société civile dont vient de mentionner notre ami Audas qui est la solidarité des intervenants de l'administration foncière mais que l'administration foncière en ce temps ne pouvait pas justement honorer toutes ces demandes. Une vision, l'objectif en ce sens était donc de sécuriser massivement, parce qu'il y avait tellement de demandes qui n'étaient pas honorées, 
à des coûts moindres parce que la population malgache, on va dire qu'il y a 80% de cette population malgache qui a 25 millions actuellement, euh, vit en dessous de 1,5 dollar, donc qui ne pouvait pas justement euh, à, à aller euh, sécuriser leur terrain par rapport à, à la procédure de l'immatriculation. Ce qui fait que on s'était dit pourquoi pas ne pas alléger cette procédure et aussi le rendre à des coûts euh, moindres. 2005, on a lancé donc cette processus. Euh, on a lancé le processus depuis 2004. Ça a été fini en 2005. Ça a été présenté. Quels ont été donc les acquis de cette réforme Déjà sur le plan juridique, c'est le fait de dire que si avant on avait dit que les terrains, tous les terrains appartenaient à l'État malgache. Donc, c'était une décision qui a été prise par tous les partenaires avec qui on a fait ce processus de consultation en disant, plus maintenant, les terrains n'appartiennent pas tous à l'État, mais il y a quand même des droits qu'il faudrait reconnaître parce qu'il y a plusieurs, il y a beaucoup de populations donc, qui sont installées sur les terrains et on va dire qu'ils sont... Euh, ils ont des droits sur ces terrains. Et c'est là où ceux qui sont des spécialistes sur le foncier, on va dire que on a abrogé donc ce fameux principe de domanialité qui veut dire que c'est les terrains appartiennent à l'État. Et on est allé dans le principe de euh, propriété, euh, la présomption de propriété. Ce qui fait que si la communauté là où vous vivez atteste que vous avez vécu là et que vous avez valorisé ce terrain-là, donc ce serait une reconnaissance au niveau local pour dire que vous avez un droit sur ces terrains. Donc, au plan de vue juridique, c'était justement l'annulation de ces principes-là, mais aussi, on a engagé le fait de dire qu'il y a trois statuts de terrain maintenant qui existent à Madagascar. Donc, un, le statut de terrain qui dit que ça appartient à l'État, des terrains qui appartiennent à l'État, et de deux, les terrains qui appartiennent donc euh, au privé, mais il y a un troisième statut de terrain, donc pour tout ce qui est à gestion euh, spécifique. Un autre aspect apport qui a été amené, c'est-à-dire au plan institutionnel, c'est que on a donné la compétence au niveau de communes qui sont plus proches donc de la communauté pour gérer ces terrains. Donc maintenant cette compétence est donnée à la commune qui est plus proche de terrain. Mais c'est pas la commune qui donne le droit, même si c'est un certificat qu'ils vont délivrer, mais c'est la commune qui atteste par là que telle personne dispose de tel terrain. Parce que la reconnaissance est faite au niveau local et c'est un comité de reconnaissance locale qui atteste donc cette euh, partie. Sur le plan de vue social, donc toutes les contestations qui devaient y avoir lieu, ça devait se faire au niveau euh, local. En quoi donc ça apporte par rapport à la communauté euh, locale C'est le fait que tout le règlement de ces problèmes ou la gestion est donné donc au niveau de la communauté locale qui est, on va dire, un plus point de, le, de la partie euh, administration euh, sociale. Merci beaucoup. All right, so I'll try to summarize a little bit what we definitely need to know. That in 2005, they started the land reform process. And the reason why it started is that civil society organization, they're the one who took the lead and said, well, only 10% of the land in Madagascar was secured. But at the same time, they realized that there were many requests from communities to legally own land, but it has never been addressed. So in 2015, they reviewed the, like, you know, uh, the law and also the policy and decided at that time that not all the land belonged to the government, but now also there are some land that will be uh, given to communities. So right now, what we have in Madagascar is we, we have three types of tenure regime, like you know, some uh, land that belong to the government, the state public land, we have private land, but also land that belong to the communities. And right now, that's what they're working around and trying to see how they can secure more of those uh, communities, right? And also try to make sure that communities can go and ask for uh, to legally have a certificate. Uh, to, to own land. So they have right now many uh, requests at the local level. But also in Madagascar, decentralization is really key. The land reform pro, uh, uh, sector in Madagascar is very decentralized. And all those local certificates have to be taken at the uh, local level with, uh, at, the, at the commune uh, level. 
So basically, that's what is really happening. So now we're seeing that people are moving away from government owning all, land, all the land, but also trying to see how they can secure uh, more of the community land. And maybe the last question I have for Kamara is that at the same time that Madagascar has this great decentralized um, reform uh, system, but also Madagascar has uh, really like, you know, um, um, committed on forest and land restoration. And they have committed by 2030 to restore 4 million hectares of, uh, of forest in Madagascar. So they're really working around that. So my question to Kamara is how are they really making the link between the land reform process and this uh, restoration effort that they're trying to do? Donc, M. Kamara, je disais qu'en même temps qu'à Madagascar, on a un système de réforme euh, foncière qui est décentralisé. On sait que le gouvernement aussi s'est euh, donné un défi de restaurer 4 millions d'hectares de forêts dégradées d'ici à 2030. Comment est-ce que vous faites le lien entre la sécurisation foncière des droits des communautés et ce, cet objectif de restauration? OK, merci Solange. En fait, je, je, je veux dire qu'effectivement, Madagascar a mis en place, a commencé un processus justement dans cette partie de restauration de paysages forestiers. Et actuellement, donc, euh, on dispose de notre stratégie nationale de la restauration des paysages et des euh, forêts. Euh, ça a été disponible depuis l'année 2017 et justement, ça a été mis en lien avec la politique foncière et la politique euh, forestière. Euh, comme tu disais, euh, on s'est engagé à restaurer 4 millions euh, d'hectares. Oui, effectivement, parce que je crois que c'est une obligation de l'État de le faire, suite à, à tous ces dévis qui ont été faits au niveau euh, international. Mais quand on sait que à Madagascar, 16 il reste 16 de couverture forestière et que tout autour de ces forêts, il y a euh, environ 70 de la population qui vit euh, et qui exploite de façon traditionnelle les ressources de ces forêts. Et de l'autre côté, on sait que 60 de la superficie de Madagascar euh, donc, font l'objet de cette dégradation euh, du ciel, du, du sol. On, 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 on ne peut que euh, prendre des décisions là-dessus. Et c'est là où on a mis en place cette euh, fameuse stratégie euh, nationale de, de restauration des, des paysages. Donc, euh, on a mis en place donc, un comité national pour, euh, pour la RPF dont faisaient partie donc, les services en charge du foncier, de l'environnement et euh, de, de la forêt. Mais effectivement, on ne peut pas restaurer sans qu'on pense qu'il n'y a pas de sécurisation de, de ces terrains. On peut pas, euh, je pense qu'on ne peut pas à, aller à dire à la population de préserver cette forêt alors qu'ils pensent que cette forêt ne leur appartient pas, que la législation malgache actuelle pense que ce sont des domaines de l'État, donc ils n'ont pas la possession, ils ont ju juste l'utilisation. Et donc, euh, les réflexions qu'on se donne actuellement, donc le ministère en charge du foncier et ceux de, de, de l'aménagement du territoire, des forêts et de l'environnement, c'est d'aller dans ce sens justement, comment sécuriser donc... Euh, les droits de la communauté euh, locale. Euh, je ne veux pas dire qu'on a déjà fini dans ce sens, mais c'est un processus qui a déjà commencé. Ça fait un an qu'on l'a déjà. La stratégie nationale, elle n'est là que depuis un an, c'est-à-dire depuis 2017. Et ce processus de réflexion, il y va toujours. Mais en tout cas, tous les acteurs euh, euh, sont d'accord pour se mettre qu'il faut d'abord sécuriser, aménager et aller dans le sens de la restauration des paysages et des forêts. Merci. Uh, thank you, Kamara. Just also to summarize here is that in Madagascar, they have uh, developed their national land restoration strategy since 2017. And the way they've done it, they've looked at the land policy and also the forest policy and see how they can really link those uh, two sectors to the restoration uh, program. But what we're really seeing in, in Madagascar is that like, you know, 70% of the communities use forest resources for their own uh, livelihood, for their consumption. 
but also at the same time, 60% of like, you know, the forest in Madagascar is uh, degraded. So that's why they re the government realized that they needed to really get involved in this restoration uh, program. But also while they are talking about restoration, they realized that the best way to start restoring is to secure the local community's uh, land right. And that's why they're trying to do their best to really give the local land certificates to communities as many as possible. Because they say, well, in order to really uh, give incentives to the communities, you really need to make sure that they own the land and the resources. That, that way, when you come and talk to them about restoration, the ownership can really uh, happen. I think this is really like, you know, a good example. Like, you know, we've heard from Kenya, we have heard from uh, Madagascar. Before I hand it to uh, the audience for questions, contribution, I would like to call on Raymond uh, from the International uh, Land uh, Tenure Facility to really talk about like, you know, um, this importance of uh, scaling up implementation of land and forest tenure reform policies and legislation and also how really to work with government, like developing tools and strategies to help implement progressive laws. For example, we heard that in Kenya, they have this Community Land Act that was adopted that has very good provisions. But I think what we know also is that Kenya is really f facing issue in developing the regulation, but also implementing. We know other countries have had like, you know, progressive law, but they started the implementation process. So we wanted to hear from Raymond what is the tenure facility? What do we really know about the say, tenure facility? When the tenure facility talked about uh, scaling up, what does it mean? And also, can you give us example of like one or two countries where the scaling up uh, had to happen? And I think I'll give you seven minutes to just talk about it in general, so people know, then we can open the floor for questions and comments. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Solange, uh, for inviting the tenure facility to this uh, session of the panel. Um, I'm Raymond Achu Samdo. I'm the monitoring, evaluation, and reporting manager of a tenure facility. The tenure facility is a new organization, but it's not really that new because it was designed by the Right and Resource Initiative and it created. But it has been now an independent international organization based in Stockholm, Sweden. And it is the, the world's first and uh, inter, only international funding mechanism that is dedicated to support, uh, provide finance and technical support to secure indigenous people and local community land rights globally. Why <clears throat> the indigenous secure, um, land, land right is very important. It is really vital for food security. We know as uh, Patrick, uh, uh, gave us some presentation on why the vulnerability that indigenous and local community face, why their land is not uh, secured. So we at the Tenu facility, our approach is um, doing development differently. By that, we provide an innovative problem and context community-driven approach to development, which is structured to provide rapid, flexible support to solve local problems by promoting um, learning and adapting. By this, we know most indigenous uh, um, organizations, indigenous community organizations, and local community, and those civil society that represent them, they have difficulties in, in accessing funds to secure their land um, rights. And we, came, we come in to fill this gap, to provide flexible, and to break through those barriers that they face, to give them flexible, uh, funding and provide technical support on how they could work with local government in securing their, um, their land and forest rights. So we believe that securing community land rights is, is a, a vital for um, poverty reduction, sustainable um, uh, development, conflict mitigation, food security, climate change, and even for restoration um, uh, um, uh, activities. And uh, this community run right underpin any real potential for landscape restoration. Uh, we have, uh, in the past uh, three years, developed different uh, pilot projects. And we are now aiming to scale up, because scaling up um, implementation of progressive laws on uh, securing land rights is, 
is a very strong um, uh, issue in our agenda. And we have uh, certain different targets. In, we, we intend to invest over $10 million for each year, for over a 10 years period, to scale up this implementation. And also to use the different tools, strategies, and uh, methods that have uh, de developed in the different project to leverage them across different scale within the government, uh, international organization like the World Bank, and uh, other uh, multinational organization to use these um, uh, tools and to scale up um, a community and uh, indigenous people land right in all other different um, uh, regions. And uh, <coughs> the projections that we, we uh, through our investment, uh, will increase title, protected, and well-managed community and indigenous tropical forest land by 42 to 91 million hectares. We, these projections are really ambitious, but we, we, we believe that with our approach on working, putting commu uh, indigenous community at the center of implementation of progressive law, we, we believe we aim, we aim to achieve this, uh, this target. And we also um, believe that increased um, tenure security we, we, we reduce deforestation, and we also increase uh, um, climate change and avoid uh, emission by 0 0.5 to 1.3 um, gigatons globally. Yeah, um, I can give you some example on a pilot. Like, let me take an example in Cameroon, where we did a pilot uh, on, um, on land use uh, mapping methodology. This is a very interesting case that uh, the World Bank is now soliciting this methodology and they are scaling up in other uh, areas of their intervention in Cameroon. And the GIS, GIZ is also soliciting this from our partners in Cameroon and trying to scale it up in other regions in Cameroon where they are supporting the Ministry of Planning and in, in Land Use Planning for local government and uh, local development. And uh, in other examples that are quite interested in is we also intervene in war uh, conflict area like in Mali and Liberia, which have experienced uh, a lot of uh, conflict. And with the uh, uh, village uh, level land commission that reduced local land conflict by more than 30%. And in Liberia, with the progressive land act law that has been enacted, we intend to increase our, uh, scale up our intervention in Liberia so that we could use this progressive law to secure more hectares of land for the local communities. Great, thank you very much, Ramon. It was really great to hear about the scaling up. So now I will open the floor for questions, comments, contribution, and maybe like five minutes before the closing, I will ask the panelists to respond to some of the questions. Okay, Helen. Good morning. Um, Ellen Pratt from Liberia. First, let me thank the Tenure Facility for the uh, progressive support that you've given and continue to give. This is a question for the panel, but particularly Madagascar. As the gentleman just mentioned, Liberia on Thursday passed a Land Rights Act, which for the first time in the history of our country will give customary land rights to indigenous people who have lived on the land for generations. I would like to know what are some of your examples of how you've worked with communities to help them to secure these land rights because the law is one thing, but the implementation of the law is another challenge in itself. So I would like to hear how you may have done that in Madagascar and what are some of the challenges you experienced in doing that, thank you. Let me just translate quick for Kamara so he can think about his uh, answer. So, Mr. Kamara, donc Ellen Pratt est du Liberia. Elle a dit que au Liberia, ils viennent juste cette semaine d'adopter euh, une loi, la, la Land Rights Act, la loi sur les droits fonciers, et c'est une loi qui est très progressive. Maintenant, elle aimerait savoir euh, à Madagascar. Comment est-ce que vous avez fait pour sécuriser euh, les droits euh, des communautés, mais aussi quels sont les défis auxquels vous êtes, vous êtes confrontés so, Elle veut essayer de voir aussi en termes de mise en œuvre quels sont les défis auxquels vous êtes confrontés.
Thank you. My name is uh, Svia Senesi. I'm from FAO and um, specifically from the Forest and Farm Facility. And um, I was very happy to hear the examples um, from, from Kenya on how indigenous women are, um, yeah, are being supported and what challenges um, they face. And my question would be maybe to Raymond from the Tenya facility, but also maybe to the guests from Madagascar. If you talk about community land rights, how do we ensure that also within the community land rights, the women have um, an important role to play and are not being excluded as well on that level. Thank you. Just for Kamara to also think about it. Um, Monsieur Kamara, donc, elle, elle dit que elle a écouté l'exemple du Kenya où on a parlé des droits de sécuriser les droits fonciers des femmes. Elle aimerait savoir avec le Tenya Facility quelles sont les approches qu'ils ont mises en place pour la sécurisation foncière des femmes, mais particulièrement aussi à Madagascar. Est-ce que dans votre processus de sécurisation des droits fonciers, les droits des femmes sont inclus? Thank you. I'm uh, Maritim from Kenya. My question goes to the two presenters, uh, that's Milka and uh, the colleague. Now, as we talk about uh, indigenous people's uh, rights and uh, the argument that uh, the indigenous people had their traditional ways of conserving, I wonder, and I want them to comment, that uh, the archaic, for example, uh, their lifestyle has already changed. Now, is the, 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 the initial uh, practice still applicable now? Because I think the archaic, uh, probably because of a changing lifestyle, they are no longer cataracts as it were, but they are now practicing agriculture. So I want a comment from them. Uh, thank you, Justin Kenrick from Forest People's Programme. Um, the very interesting presentations and particularly the focus on securing, securing community rights in order to secure both the livelihoods of those communities but also to stop deforestation. I was wanting to ask Shadrach, Shadrach raised the issue of the difficulty of consultation in multi-stakeholder platform contexts. And I wanted to ask whether you find the distinction between rights holders and stakeholders useful so that you recognize communities as being the rights holders to their lands, and then other stakeholders you bring in because they're important players to discuss. But consultation only works when you base it on FPIC, on free prior and informed consent, so fundamentally the community can say yes or no to that situation. So basically, the distinction between rights holders and, and stakeholders is key to finding a resolution of the issue. And in that, whether part of the process is also dialogue within communities to be able to find sustainable ways forward and that those are ones that only they can find and not ones that can be imposed on them. Merci. Cette session est mixte, anglais et français. Je voudrais m'adresser à ma soeur autochtone kenyane au sujet de la restauration. Si les femmes autochtones sont aussi incorporées dans la prise de décision qui concerne la restauration des paysages au Kenya. Aussi, euh, elle a parlé des challenges et des opportunités. Quelles sont les opportunités qui sont offertes aux femmes autochtones pour euh, la restauration des paysages au niveau du Kenya, pour qu'elles puissent partager l'expérience avec les autres femmes indigènes qui viennent d'autres pays d'Afrique Merci. I'll translate for Milka. But I heard Kenyan, they speak French, so do I? Oh, okay. All right. So, so uh, Maman Dorote is uh, indigenous and she's from the DRC. And basically, she enjoyed your presentation. And what she wanted to know is in terms of like, you know, restoration program that you have, how are indigenous women involved in the decision making processes when it comes to restoration? And second, that, you know, what are the opportunities for women in, when it comes to restoration? because she wanted to know that experience and see how that can be shared also with all the indigenous women uh, in the DRC. Thank you. Um, my name is Albert Kataku uh, from Civic Response, an NGO based in Ghana. And I have a question each for Minka and uh, Shadrach. Uh, my, um, for Minka, I sympathize with your communities that government is not appreciating your lifestyle 
in promoting conservation. And I wanted to find out, is there any legal provision, perhaps constitutional provision, that guarantees communities like yours their basic human rights to existence that you can fall on to make the government aware that your rights are being violated? And if yes, how have you exploited that? If no, are there other venues that you have to address this kind of, this kind of challenge? Um, and Shadrach, uh, my question is, to what extent has the multi-stakeholder processes been adopted by other platforms? And I'm asking this because, I mean, in Ghana, we have a very good multi-stakeholder platform or process in the FLEG VPA, which is under the Forestry Commission, uh, Forestry Commission and which was hailed internationally as one of the best multi-stakeholder processes. And yet, red processes, which is within the same ministry, the same um, Forestry Commission, and probably using the same stakeholders, are struggling with their own multi-stakeholder processes, mainly because of uh, the inability to break down silos between state agencies. And I'm trying to find out, do you have similar um, experiences uh, in your multi-stakeholder processes. Thank you. I thought the people on this side of the room were having their rights removed. Uh, I've got a three, three areas of questions. One, clarity on what we mean by tenure, security of rights, individual rights, communal rights. I'm not sure who, who to address this to. Second point is, it's been raised I think a bit, is that in Africa, especially in many countries, Kenya is an example, we have good policies in place. We have good implementation, uh, we have good laws in place, but we have very poor implementation. Why, how can we change that around? And lastly, it's a bit more complex. A lot of what I've heard and what I, my own understanding is there has been conflictual positions between government and representatives of indigenous peoples. How can we move from conflictual to negotiated outcomes where we start respecting and recognizing the rights and responsibilities of both indigenous peoples, as we've heard, and the rights and responsibilities of government? Thank you. <coughs> yeah, thank you very much. My name is Steve Nsita from Uganda. And my question is uh, open to any of the panel members. Now, in Uganda, we experience uh, in trying to work with the local communities to, to secure their rights, because actually the law, as the previous speaker has just stated, has stated the rights of local communities. But the problem is getting the communities to secure them, to negotiate with these uh, powerful state agencies. Because when you march, when the communities sit together with state agencies, there is a, a tendency to patronize, but do nothing. So I don't know what your experiences are, but also the other aspect of it is that even with state agencies trying to play along, they are powerful private sector interests who would come and take advantage of the local community and by the time they wake up, the land is registered in private interests and then you need a legal battle which, which local communities can ill afford. Do you have any experiences in the other countries? Thank you. All right, thank you for all those relevant and some tough questions. So I'll give maybe three minutes for each panelist to try to capture that. I'll start with our host, Kenya, then Peter and Milka, if you can start answering some of the questions, please. Uh, I'll try and answer some of the questions that were directed to us and maybe Peter will pick up on some. Um, so our sister from DRC asking how women have been involved in the decision making processes. So currently uh, among the Sengwer, 
of course, before in the Council of Elders, there were no women in the, in the, in the decision-making platform. But uh, currently, there are women because uh, I personally decided to start speaking about why they should be in the, in the decision-making platform. And the elders understood why. Because for me, I, I just tried to imagine that it is, maybe these land rights have not been realized, so the government has not been able to listen to our cries for a long time. Maybe because it's only been men who have been going to meet their male counterparts from the government, and all of them will be beating tables. You know, we want to know who is powerful. But when women say what they go through, what their children go through, then it cools down the temper and the efforts for people to try to show who is powerful than who. And now there are women in the Council of Elders, and we've had forums where women have been the ones to tell the National, National Land Commission, for example, back in 2016, on the situation, and you could see the change on how they receive the news when it is from women. So women are taking up that. And the women have come together now to start using songs, traditional songs, to convey the message, convey their, their whatever the, the suggestions that they're putting forward as a community. Because um, being in a, in a patriarchal community, the women have in, in, in a way conformed to the traditional way of life, you know, it's meant to say it. But when they come up together to sing, then they can collectively give out that message, and the Sengwe women of Embobut are doing that. Uh, when it comes to their, their role in restoration, as I said before, uh, they have to change how this message is being passed on to the children, and make sure that the children and the young generation own the process itself. So the women in Embobut are uh, looking forward to having a cultural center where they can do this teaching and also have uh, a kind of uh, a program to teach the community or yeah, to make them own the process like I said before. And uh, Albert from Ghana, you're wondering if we have legal provisions for our rights. We do. As Peter said, the constitution is very clear. Um, f like uh, the protection of our, not only our land rights, but also our rights as human beings, you know, the right to life, the right to property. But when the government comes around, the Kenya Forest Service used this law of, you know, because the British government just implanted this thought into people that protected areas are not to be inhabited. And so they will say it's an order or it's the law or it's something because even the new law that was enacted in 2016 has not yet been operationalized and they will want to use whatever they have been used to to evict the community and look at that as a kind of a superior law against any other. So that's causing the suffering. It's not like we don't have the, law, the laws in place. We have them, but implementation is a, is a real problem. We have one minute because Thank we have to oh. give the a priority and then the whole idea of not really recognizing that for example in in a topic that we have today that you know rights to communities uh, when we are talking about restoration and uh, protection of forests the right to their tenure is actually a way that we would be protecting this forest so there's that uh, yes and then uh, about uh, the last one, uh, Steve, uh, imp uh, impl um, um, uh, the government uh, implementation, the government, uh, local communities, and private sector. I think that is the, ch the challenge that we have. Uh, private sector, according to community lands, uh, private sector, and most of the private sector, or uh, in this case, maybe investors, are not, some of them, or majority of them, feel. Uh, when communities have rights to their lands, it's a threat to their investment. They don't look at it that actually uh, rights, wh when there's clarity in, in land rights, especially on community land rights, it's an investment or uh, their investment is secured. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. 
minute each. Okay, thank you. I, I just quickly want to talk about to talk about the uh, the question from civic response in Ghana about the adoption of for this um, MSF approach. Uh, one of the three strategic objectives of this MSF is the very first one is uh, we call it connecting. This consists in um, making sure that as many as possible stakeholders are involved in this process. So uh, members, the initial members, they really have the mandate to uh, involve as many stakeholders, as many actors as possible in the process. And this is actually contributing to really uh, having more uh, actors adopting the, 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 the approach in the country. And another, um, another way to encourage uh, uh, adoption and, and, and more and more um, of working together is in countries where there are already um, uh, uh, multi platforms, uh, when our members approach us to, to start a, a, a platform like that one, we encourage them to, to, um, to join the one existing and, and, and to, 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 uh, to make sure that the strategy, the engagement strategy uh, to influence land policies in the country are, are not, are, are not, are not uh, just a duplication of, of what actors are doing, but that they strengthen the existing platform there. Uh, with that, we, 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 we have seen that uh, it, uh, platforms become stronger when more actors are involved. Thank you. I was wondering how the three minutes ended very quickly. <laughs> Number one, uh, uh, just in right holders and uh, stakeholders, I think uh, in the multi-stakeholder platform, we have parameters. And uh, one of the key parameters to identify actors or the people to include is that you would definitely need to look at who are the right holders in this particular circumstance, who are the duty bearers, and who are other interested people. So there is that close relationship that brings in that nuancing. So the right holders are part and parcel of the stakeholders. Uh, in terms of the dialogue within and between the communities, yes, for any right holder or duty bearer to make any meaningful contribution in a multi-stakeholder platform, it is important that they have their own mechanism also of doing their own internal consultations. Actually, at the community level, that one is very important because it is that that will keep that community together. Number two, in terms of uh, uh, Ghana, whether we are experiencing the challenge with the departments, uh, ministries, or institutions going uh, pursuing the silos. Yes, but we also have seen the value in terms of uh, the multi-stakeholder platforms. For instance, in Kenya, we have land sector and state actors that bring civil societies, the academia, researchers, private sector, and professional bodies together. The only group that has been coming in and out is still the government, but we are still pursuing that so that that is put into perspective. One minute, that's enough for two questions. <laughs> poor, good policies, poor implementation. How do we change it? One, let us engage intensively in building the capacity of communities and investing on awareness creation. The information and knowledge gap is what makes implementation a challenge. Two, let's focus on consensus building. During policy formulation, it is a competition. Once you have a policy document or a law, you need to build consensus so that different people who had competing ideas are able now to develop joint actions. And three, ensure that resource allocations or fundings is done on, uh, based on these blueprints. Projects and programs need to be based on the agreed policies, on the agreed laws. That will help move that forward. What do we do about the moving the conflictual relationship between the IPs and the governments? One is contextualization of demands so that we appreciate what is already existing and how to build on that. Thank you. Thank you. Raymond? Yeah, um, 
women right is it uh, on the tf agenda yes gender equality and women rights are very important in our programs and operation and with that we uh, uh, we will soon in burkina faso initiate uh, a project that focuses only on women rights and by this project we aim to to target the land right of 200 women over 3,000 hectares, and this was, we involve 6,000 women. And we, in the tenure facility, also want to scale up this type of implementation in other uh, countries in Africa, where there are progressive law that uh, recognize the right of women. We've just heard uh, that Kenya has this type of progressive law on supporting the right of women. And, it is an opportunity that we could explore with the tenure facility on how we could support that. Yeah, the issue of our clarity within community rights and individual rights. Um, community tenure involves the, those bundles of rights from access to alienation. And when community, this bundle of rights are protected under community land rights, it increases community position for, uh, for, to compete we just heard uh, that in Kenya, when community land rights are secure, private sectors, they are afraid to compete because they know community position is really strong. But with individual land rights, it is easy to alienate. People just they can easily sell it and move on. But with community, it's difficult to get that uh, large aspect of uh, or, uh, the bundle of right. And then the issue of implementation, which uh, uh, from Uganda, Yes, the implementation, within implementation, communities are at the weaker position. And that is one of the reasons that uh, tenure facility was designed to fill that gap, to support communities and indigenous people in implementing this progressive law. So in that context, we really, we are, we really focus our funding and technical support to increase the community position on how they could secure their land and be in there and empower them to face uh, competition with private sector and government. But we don't really work entirely with the uh, community without working with local government because for this land right to be recognized, you need a third party, which is the government. So we also support in Panama and other places in Latin America who support community to claim their land through court cases. These are uh, issues that are difficult for community because of lack of resources and information, knowledge, and so we provide all that technical support uh, in supporting community to build in, to empower themselves by securing their land rights. D'accord, merci, merci Solange. Uh, je vais aller dans le sens de notre ami qui est uh, à notre gauche là, qui disait que effectivement. Dans la plupart des pays, on a des belles politiques et des belles euh, lois. Et Madagascar aussi, on fait de ces euh, pays qui ont des belles politiques et des lois qui, euh, qui sont là. Par rapport donc à l'aspect euh, femme, euh, la constitution malgache met au même pied d'égalité que ce soit l'homme et la femme. Il n'y a pas d'autres lois qui le disent. Mais en tout cas, donc, légalement, on a les mêmes lois loi. Mais ce n'est pas la réalité, parce que la réalité, effectivement, il y a d'autres cultures qui n'ont pas été euh, prises en considération. Peut-être une explication qu'on peut avancer, c'est que les lois qui ont été mises en place depuis les années, je dirais, euh, 1800-1900, c'était plus des copier coller de, de l'administration coloniale qui n'a pas voulu considérer cette culture euh, locale et donc, euh, on a euh, deux choses euh, euh, différentes. J'aimerais simplement vous dire qu'au niveau de Madagascar, avant les années 1896, c'est-à-dire avant la colonisation, on avait euh, trois reines qui ont dirigé euh, Madagascar pour dire qu'effectivement, du côté de Madagascar, euh, on met au, dans un piédestal aussi euh, les femmes. Mais est-ce que c'est le cas actuellement Je ne pense pas. Parce qu'il y a beaucoup de difficultés euh, dans ce sens, surtout euh, euh, sur la mise en œuvre de toutes ces pratiques. Comment est-ce que, euh, dans la partie opérationnelle, comment est-ce qu'on a pu justement euh, faire un appui, donc au niveau euh, de l'aspect euh, femme, 
et aussi les communautés locales. Euh, il y a eu des outils juridiques qui ont été mis en place avant donc, cette réforme foncière, justement qui fait le lien entre la sécurité foncière et la restauration des, des paysages forestiers, c'est-à-dire c'est de mettre en place ce fameux euh, gestion locale sécurisée. Ce qui, veut, ce qui fait qu'il fallait donc transférer la gestion de ces terres, terres communales au niveau de la communauté et donc de mettre en place donc ces fameux communautés de base qui devaient justement euh, gérer ce, ce foncier. Et l'autre outil qui a été mis en place, c'est ce fameux, euh, que nous on va dire, euh, sécurisation foncière relative. Le hic par rapport à ces outils, c'était que ce n'est pas un droit, on va dire qu'un droit plein qu'on a donné à la communauté, mais c'était plus un droit d'usage relatif, comme le dit la sécurisation foncière relative. Et, dès que, et si on ne devait pas donner cette fameuse sécurisation foncière optimale qu'après 15 ou 20 ans, que quand euh, la communauté... Quand l'administration ait pu juger que la communauté a bien euh, géré euh, ce terrain. Ben, effectivement, donc, le rapport qui nous est arrivé actuellement, c'est qu'il euh, y a peu donc, de contrats de gestion qui, qui ont été allés euh, euh, jusqu'à cette sécurisation euh, foncière optimale. La pré-réforme, euh, effectivement, on a continué cette euh, politique, mais le, le, le plus intéressant par rapport à, à, à la question euh, de Mme euh, Hélène tout à l'heure, c'est de dire que 2005, donc, euh, c'est les certificats fonciers donc, au niveau de la communauté, au niveau donc, euh, de, euh, des usagers au niveau local. Et ce qu'on a mis dans le certificat foncier, parce qu'avant, dans le titre, c'était uniquement « monsieur et consort ». Monsieur et famille. Maintenant, c'est qu'on a poussé les femmes justement à revendiquer leurs droits sur les terrains et on a précisément que ce soit monsieur ou madame qui peuvent donc euh, disposer de ce euh, certificat foncier. Mais je pense aussi qu'au niveau terrain, ce n'est pas tout à fait l'administration qui manque de moyens qui va aller aider la, la communauté. Mais c'est là où on travaille avec la société civile. C'est là où on a cette fameuse plateforme où je dirais que la société civile fait un relais à l'administration pour ses travaux au niveau euh, local. On n'a pas encore quelque chose de bien précis pour le moment, comme je disais que c'est. On commence maintenant justement à réfléchir, réfléchir sur cet aspect juridique, législation pour ça, mais euh, on va aller dans ce sens. Merci bien. Good. Just a quick summary and we'll close this because I think we're running out of time. We're like, you know at least 10 minutes. So three things uh, from Kamara's intervention. Madagascar is like many African countries when it comes to implementation. They have like, you know, <laughs> progressive law policy, but the implementation is really a big uh, challenge. When it comes to women, is that if you look at the Malagasy uh, constitution, it said like, you know, equal right like for men and for women. So in that sense, that's what they're using to say, well, there should be no discrimination. But when you go deeper at the local level, you know, with all the cultural aspect related to it, you'll see that there's a big difference between what is said in the constitution and what is uh, happening on the ground. But one thing that we need to know that in Madagascar, prior to the colonial period, Madagascar was like run by queens. The queen were really, and there were three queens that really successfully uh, like run the country before the colonial period. And uh, in terms of like securing local uh, communities right at the, um, securing their right at the local level, they have developed some tools. They have these legal tools to secure uh, land right, but also there's something that they call the relative uh, tenure security of communities. And when they say relative uh, tenure security, it means it's just related to land use but no land ownership and that has been like you know a challenge and people have been really talking about how do you change that type of uh, recognition to a full ownership uh, by the local communities they also have these local land certificates before it was only like you know the man who would just go and uh, ask for this local land certificate but now there's a possibility for a woman to go and have their own like uh, a local land certificate And please join me in thanking all these great panelists for the great contribution. And I think also I thank you all for 
the great contribution, your questions, and for being with us for uh, more than 90 minutes. Thank you.